It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 169, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Nate Fingerly has been farming with his family at River Ridge Farm in north central Indiana for 10 years. With one and a half acres of production and 10,000 square feet of high tunnels, River Ridge provides vegetables to its customers year round. River Ridge has found success in a rural agricultural community with a combination of farmers markets, an on farm retail store, and restaurant sales. We dig into how Nate and his family make all of this work and some of the details of how a lot of hustle has helped cobble together a successful business in an unlikely marketplace. Nate also shares his straightforward production techniques, including field work, fertility planning, transplant production, irrigation, weed control, and how he makes season extension really pay in the, inside the high tunnels and out. Please note, as you're listening, that this episode was recorded in March of 2018, as Nate makes a lot of references to what's happening now on his farm. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving professional organic growers with a full line of 100% certified organic and non-GMO project verified vegetable, herb, flower, and cover crop seeds. Highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer. And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven, built to last for decades dependable service, BCS America. Dot com. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Nate Fingerly, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's, yeah, listen to you guys for years and yeah, I'm glad to be a part of it today. Excited that you could join us you and I were chatting a little bit before the show and you were like, well, how the, how the heck did you find me? Cause you're just, you're, you're not very visible online, but yours is a name that has come up again and again. When I talked to Indiana farmers and when I was just at the Indiana small farms conference at the beginning of March, I had two or three different people come up and say, you've got to get Nate on the show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so there now, now I've set the expectations really high for you. Sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'd like to start off by having you tell us about River Ridge Farm. You know, how many vegetables are you guys growing? What are you doing that's special there? How um, how are you selling your produce? And and I guess, mm -hmm. and also, where yeah. are you guys located there in Indiana? Very good. Okay, so um, we've been in business 10 years. Uh, we dabbled in it about 11 years ago. We started experimenting at farmers markets and, uh, yeah, found out it was going to be wildly successful. Anyway, so. Um, we are farming on, I own three and a half acres here is where I was actually born and raised. And, uh, we have, uh, an acre and cropping out about an acre to acre and a half. Um, if you, if you include the pathways, we're an acre and a half. If you include just the production zones, we're, um, exactly an acre square footage wise. And we have 10,000 square feet of high tunnels that we grow in. And that's where we're year round. Kind of our motto is, um, yeah, 12 or four seasons of, of fresh vegetables is our motto here on our logo. Um, so as far as where we're at, we are located in north central Indiana. Um, we're an hour south of Ben Hartman's Shadow in Goshen, Indiana. He and I are good friends. We've actually done a fair project together at Purdue University. And so we got to know him real well. We ordered some things together from Vermont Compost. And anyway, um, so we're kind of in his shadow. Everybody knows Indiana farmer Ben Hartman, and, and that's great. I, I'm glad he gets the limelight. Um, as far as where we're at, we're located in northern Wabash County, which is a very rural ag community. In county, uh, the, the city of Wabash has got a, a population of 12,000. The city of North Manchester, which is where we're close to, is uh, 6,000 people. The one advantage we have there is it has got a liberal arts college, Manchester University, and that brings a whole um, dynamic set of, of what I call the foodie crowd. Um, but it's interesting in the sense that they're the foodies that come to our, our place, our store here, but we also have just the regular farm uh, people, just the common everyday people, and they're home gardeners. They don't necessarily buy from in the summertime always, but they know what good food is and they know what it tastes like and they want it year round. So anyway, that's um, kind of the, um, a little bit of the background. Um, we are on a half mile dead end road uh, on the north bank of the Eel River. So we're kind of, we're kind of hard to find. We tell people if they're here at the store, because we have an on-farm retail store. If you're here, you're here because you want to be, or you're here because you're lost, hopelessly lost. <laughs> you don't just stumble on us. You just don't. Um, so anyway, the, um, my wife and I have got, we have 10 children. Um, we've been married 20 years um, and they range from our oldest to 17. He has a pile of help here on the farm. 
and then they go down to our baby a year and a half, which yeah, before you think we got crazy, we actually adopted four in the middle there. So, um, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, large family, they help out tremendously on the farm. And that was part of the vision of even doing what we're doing is I was a very lazy kid growing up. Um, yeah, I grew up here on the river and I loved the fish. I loved the outdoors and I could have cared less about school and could have cared less about working. I worked just enough to get much enough money to buy more fishing gear. And anyway, people that know me when I was a youth think, man, <laughs> you're doing this. And we, we have an acre and a half of produce. We have 10 children and my wife homeschools. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, by the grace of God, we do what we do. Um, and we love it. Absolutely love the life. I, for uh, about uh, 12 years, I worked in the RV industry in Northern Indiana and made a pile of money, made a crazy amount of money, um, but was never happy. I was indoors was in, on a production line, was in the service department, uh, made ridiculous amounts of money. I mean, eighty to $100,000 a year income. And, uh, but I was away from the family, I was away from my wife. I'm like, this stinks. And uh, I've been around, well, back when I was in high school, and I give a lay of, of how I got into this. When I was in high school, so I, I prefaced by saying I was lazy as a kid. And in um, ninth grade, I took an intro to ag class. And uh, in the FFA class, it was um, intro to horticulture and intro to landscaping. And it was probably in late February, I think, about this time of year. And uh, they took us out to the local greenhouse there to do some, some transplanting of flats. And I'm like, I walked into this greenhouse. It was cold. It was snowy. I walked into this greenhouse, and it was like 65 degrees. It was moist smelling. There was flowers in bloom. I'm like, this is awesome. I don't think I've ever been in a greenhouse. And uh, I absolutely loved it. So I fell in love with it, worked for him. Uh, for the, the guy in the greenhouse was a very large um, company. They had a wholesale division plus the retail. Worked there for um, four years during high school, graduated. I worked there for the next year out of high school. My wife actually was in a plant nursery um, just up the road from us. So we both have a little bit of background in greenhouse and horticulture, but uh, couldn't make a living at it. We actually ended up starting when we first got married. We ended up having a greenhouse. Um, had three greenhouses, grew flowers, and you know the whole, the whole mix, bedding plants and and all those things. And um, as we were, we've done it probably six or eight years and uh, we realized we really have to get very large, move from our location where we're at. We absolutely love it. It's very wooded here on the banks of the river. We didn't really want to move away. And uh, so I sold the greenhouses off and one of my customers said, well, you got to keep the greenhouses and grow vegetables in. And I'm like, vegetables, all I like doing is flowers, you know, forget vegetables. I hated vegetable gardening as a kid. And uh, anyway, um, through that, so I was still working at the factory, and I was like, yeah, I hated being indoors, especially in springtime. You know, the doors would be open, the birds would be out there singing. And I'm like, man, I'm inside. I hate this. So anyway, the, the, the apex for us was I remember getting Organic Gardening Magazine back when I was, you know, there again when I was a teenager. And uh, I remember seeing in there a picture of a guy. He had a sock cap on. He had a coat on. You can see he's in a greenhouse. He's been over these rows harvesting greens, and there's snow outside. Had no idea what it was. So I went down to the basement, dug through all my books or all the magazines and found the article on Elliot Coleman. And lo and behold, he had this book called The Four Seasons Harvest. And so I rushed and bought the book and instantly was like, wow, there is, there's actually a possibility. And this would have probably been, um, it would have been in October of 2000, probably six or seven. And uh, we ended up digging some broccoli plants out in the garden, put them in the greenhouse we did keep one of our greenhouses when we sold the flower greenhouse off i kept one of the small ones and uh, put a cold frame over top of it and then i started seeing lettuce and we had lettuce so it was in october and sometime by thanksgiving time we had fresh lettuce come out of the greenhouse and uh, i'm like wow this is pretty cool stuff so we experimented planted some more i think even planted some mosh clear back then and uh, ended up taking you know it was like an eight foot cold frame more than my wife and i could eat started taking the uh, excess lettuce up to the, the factory where i was working one of the guys in the service department's like man, Nate, you hate working here. You hate being inside a building. Why don't you do this for a living? And that was like, it clicked. I'm like, hey, I could, you know, why don't we try this? And uh, so we ended up um, going to the farmer's market. That would have been the summer of 2007 in our local community in North Manchester farmer's market here. And there was an old time organic farmer there. He's been doing it for 30 plus years. And they got all the business. I mean, he had just gorgeous stuff. And I had like a couple bags of lettuce and I had some early summer squash and a couple early melons in June because I planted them in the greenhouse early. And uh, we're like, well, this isn't going to work. And so we went to the city of Wabash, which is about uh, 20 minutes south of us, our county seat here. And the first Saturday, we had one little measly table off the back of the truck. And the people were like, wow, you know, lady after lady had come through. Like, now this is a real farmer's market because some of, it, some of the people there are actually selling, um, they're buying in produce from an auction somewhere and then they're reselling it. Or it's the old time, you know, there's the good old boys in town that are raising, 
zucchini the size of your arm and, and uh, everything overgrown, the beans that are lumpy and selling them for, for dirt cheap. So we came in with bonafide garden fresh picking its prime produce. And uh, anyway, that's kind of how we got into the farmer's market. And we've been doing that for the last 11 years. And then we have an on-farm retail store, um, which I can get into more of that later. Um, let's see what else we do at four restaurants. We have the most of them are here local. There is one about a half hour from us. And we've got Manchester Community Schools, which we do on a limited, limited basis. We do a little bit of wholesaling with some lettuce and carrots for them, some tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Uh, we do that. We're, we're fairly uh, limited on that um, just because of our scale operation. And then we also, if we need to, we do an email delivery system. It's kind of modeled after uh, Paul and Allison Whitinger's um, system of sending out an email, customers order, and then we drop it off actually at two local coffee shops and people pick up the, the produce. So anyway, it's kind of a... That's the long and the short of it. I can get into a whole lot more. Yeah, I love farming and love what we do. Tell me more about that on-farm store. Is that a significant part of your business? It is. I, I don't have the exact sales figures, but um, we tell people when we ask, when they ask, and um, definitely 50%, if not probably closer to 75% of our total sales in a season um, are sold right here off the farm. Um, in, in the sense that, so we started out 10 years ago, <laughs> I had no idea. So when we started out 10 years ago, all I wanted to do, I knew I didn't want to work at the factory. I wanted to work at home. I wanted to teach my children to be much more of a, a diligent worker than I was because I was not that way as a kid. And uh, so we started out and I figured I would be going door to door with my little red wagon, asking people to buy my, my produce. And it is, I mean, they have literally, kind of like the old motto goes, you build it and they will come. I mean, we're a half mile bed end road and they beat a door. I mean, they beat a path to our door. And so the first summer uh, we set up in our garage, we cleaned out an area and I hung up some white fiberglass paneling and, we had a little refrigerator in there and a couple of tables set up and we were doing business. I mean, they'd come in the driveway, you know, and, and, uh, as we had five customers in a day, we were busy back in, in 2008 when we started. And, uh, that was great through the summertime. And then we realized, Hey, it's going to get cold. Now what are we going to do? We were having, we had, um, we had one greenhouse and we was building a second tunnel by then. And, uh, we're like, we got to do something. So we had a little mud room in the back of the house and we ended up insulating it and putting tile floor down and painting the walls. And it's an eight by 16 foot room. And we end up plumbing it and putting, I think it, it was a triple basin wash sink in one side. And uh, on the other side, we had two tables and our refrigerator. And so we had our nice little, little tiny store in there. And that we worked for a couple of years. I think we built a store in 2012. Our drive is probably 200 feet long, uh, foot long drive. And so we, we actually built the store right out at the, at the um, roadside and at the edge of our drive. And, um, and it, we, so basically at 2012, so from 2008, when we started 2012, um, our customer base obviously picked up tenfold. Um, and so and when the store was in the back of our house, if we had our hour sign posted in, you know, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it's, you could look right in from that room into the kitchen and we'd be in there getting supper ready and they'd knock. I mean, we had people come at eight o'clock at night and we're like, well, what do you do? I mean, you're there. Yeah, we'll sell you produce. And so now with the store, number one, it's out at the end of the drive. Um, when six o'clock comes, the sign says closed, we're closed. I mean, we don't, you know, there's no obligation to go out now. So as far as, yeah, you'd ask them, um, very significant part of our, of our income in the sense that, um, so farmer's market would run from the third Saturday of May through the third Saturday of October. And we're open. So when we do the farmer's market, those, those Saturdays, it's 20, I think 22 Saturdays that we do farmer's market. The rest of the year and even during that time, our store is open uh, Monday through Friday eight to six and then on Saturdays eight to two and then we're closed on Sunday. Um but we would sell easily. So in the summertime I would match if I sell two thousand dollars of the produce here at, at the store in the summertime, we can guarantee I'll sell at least that much, if not twice that much at the farmers market. Um okay. and uh, even our even our um our restaurants and I sound kind of snooty when I say this, but when I restaurants I didn't actually pursue them. They came to me and said, hey, most of these are all local farm to table restaurants. And they said, hey, we've heard about you. Can we buy your stuff? And I'm like, well, uh, sure. Number one, I'm not a wholesaler because I'm on an acre and a half. And number two, I'm selling everything I can possibly produce at this point um, at retail. I said, if you, want to buy, if you want to buy it at retail price and you want to come and pick it up at the farm, I don't have time to deliver it. If you want to come pick it up, great. And so we've had anywhere from four to six. We have two of them that actually kind of come and go. Um, in, the summer, in, the, in the spring, summer, and fall, we have abundance of it. They come. This time of year, we, we back out. In the wintertime, we back out and don't sell the, the lettuce mix to them. And um, yeah, they have people literally uh, beat a, a path to our door. I said earlier, uh, let's see, you know, we had five or six people in the summertime in 2008. Now, if we have 20 or 30 people, 
Um, that's a, that's a good, that's a busy day for us. It's a, a very average day. Um, I will say this, the one part that, that does hurt is basically it's farmer's market 24 seven while we're here working. So we're out in the back 40 and we get the radio alert goes off saying that we've got a customer. I mean, somebody's got to go and take care of them, which we're getting now. So when we started out in 2008, we had, our oldest was seven and we've added obviously quite a few children since then, but it was basically my wife and I, and it was like, Oh man, sometimes we were just always constantly seem like going taking care of a customer. Now that we've got, I think we have four or five of our oldest children can take care of the store. One of our employees can too. We all have these handheld radios that interface with the uh, alert system. So and we can contact back and forth who's going to get them, who's not going to go. Um, so anyway, those things have all worked out very well. However, it is kind of a pain that at times we do have to stop. And, and even mealtime, we can, we can eat yeah, our, our lunch at 11. We can eat it at 12.30. We can eat it at 1. And I can just about guarantee we haven't had anybody all morning. And all of a sudden, we'll have a flood of people come over our lunchtime. But anyway, it's just part of having a store on the farm. I mean, when you talk about that store on the farm, you guys really are, you're on a dead-end road. I mean, it, and it is right. something that, that people, I mean, you really couldn't stumble on this place. I'm looking at the map. And right. so how do people find you? What, what's your outreach and how do you actually get people out to the store? Yeah. So on, on outreach and getting people here, um, we said it's viral advertising. Um, it started, it started by word, it goes virtually by word of mouth. Um, it, it started, I would probably say, so we started out, day was, so in 2007, I'll back up a bit, in 2007, when we were at the farmer's market toying with it, um, they actually, one of the radio stations came through and I'll tie all this together. One of the radio stations came through and done a, uh, a, uh, like a one minute blip for all the vendors there. And I happened to mention that we were who we were, um, where we was located and that we were, um, wanting to do this full time. And we were putting up greenhouses. We was going to do this, you know, we was gonna have lettuce and so forth in the winter time. And one of the men that was listening to the program that day was the business director from the local community schools. And who then, Incidentally, his um, daughter was actually in, in the same class as me in school, and he recognized my name, and uh, he came down to the farmer's market the next Saturday and introduced himself and, and uh, said, hey, I'm, I'm the, the business director from the community schools. I've been, I read, he had read um, Barbara Kingsolver's book, Animal, Vegetable, Miracle, and he was really interested in getting local produce into the schools, and uh, he said, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, he just on, out of handshake, said, I will buy your first winter's production of lettuce out of the greenhouse. And so we're like, bingo, there it was. And so we started selling um, produce that very first uh, summer and winter in 2000, actually 2007, before we was actually officially in business, started selling um, produce to the schools, mostly um, cut lettuce mix. And uh, so from that, they, it was a quality of lettuce they had never seen before. And all the staff was like, whoa, where'd you get this stuff? So the, the, uh, the dietitian, the head cook lady, she would say, well, you know, told her where we got it from. And then she actually, for about two weeks, she would put orders in for the staff. And after two weeks, she says, Nate, we got to do something different. This is not working out. It's a financial, I mean, it's a disaster. I can't keep the, the school's lettuce separate from, from the, the staff orders. So she says, is there any way you can come in on, on another day? And so we was doing, we'd actually drop produce on Tuesdays at the school. And so she said, how about you come in on Thursday? So it actually, that's actually, we got started immediately um, by bringing fresh lettuce to the schools, whatever they had ordered on Tuesdays. And coming back in with orders on Thursdays by email um, for the staff. And just so happens that because we have that um, Manchester University right here, it's a small liberal arts college area in our community. There's a lot of crossover as far as, you know, maybe one of the spouses worked at the, the school as a teacher and one of them was a professor at the university. And so then it just it kind of snowballed from there. So within the local community, very rapidly, people started finding out about us. And then when we went to the farmer's market down there in Wabash, we were kind of, I mean, like with a new kid on the block and we had a top quality um, produce that they hadn't seen. Most of the people hadn't seen fresh lettuce mix in a bag. And, and we used Johnny seeds and we went through the catalog and have since day one, we always found the best varieties, the best flavored. We pick them at, at optimum size. And uh, so anyway, th that all snowballed. Then people was like, well, when the farmer's market said, well, where, where can we get this stuff? And I said, well, actually, you know, we got a little tiny store there at our farm. You can come up there and, and get things for the winter. And it's just kind of went from there. Um, we do, I think a couple of years ago, we got a Facebook page and uh, for the farm, uh, River Ridge Farm. And we do, we try to do, we guarantee our customers will do a weekly post at least. It actually ends up being more than that. When we first had it, I actually, I was like, I'm not a technological guy. I don't really care for it. And uh, so I had stopped doing posts actually. And then ladies would be like, man, yeah, we really like seeing your you know, updates of what you're doing on the farm. And it kind of becomes the promotion. As we're, we're the face of the farm. They can actually 
whether they come to the farm or not, they can actually see what we're doing. And then it actually, we had a local farmer had dropped me like 40 watermelon out of his garden. He had way too many watermelon. He said, can you sell these things? And I said, sure, we'll, we'll sell them for you. So I sent them out, took a picture of them, done a Facebook post. And by the end of the day, all 40 of those watermelon was gone, which is a product I don't normally sell. And a number of people said, I actually saw your Facebook post. And that's why they came out. Oh, great. So anyway, that was kind of alert to us that, hey, we, this is something, social media is something we need to, to do a little bit of, have a little bit of a presence in. And uh, so anyway, that kind of, and I will say this too. I was going to mention that on the farm store. So I'm kind of all over the place on it. Um, on our, our store, we sell, we do produce and we do produce well. We sell that here. We actually have um, another farm locally here. He's a certified organic farm. And he got into doing what he's doing because of what we were doing. He saw our success. He goes to Fort Wayne. Um, he put up, I think he has three tunnels now. He doesn't always sell his stuff. So in the wintertime, he actually supplements my lettuce and spinach production with some of his own. Um, we actually just saw it um, on commission for him. Um, then we also have partnered with, we, we look at ourselves as an aggregator here at the store because we do vegetables and we do them really, really well. And then we've got a, a family that does pastured beef and we sell their beef here in the store. We have a family that does um, pastured pork. We sell that here. And we have another guy that does uh, chicken and turkeys and we sell that here. We have a um, farm raised venison. It's all local. All these are local products um, actually within the county or the next county north of us. Um, we have a, an Amish farm that does some eggs for us. We have a, we have a few eggs ourselves, mostly just for the kids to have chores to do. Um, we have a farm that does goats here locally, and we, we sell their goat's milk, their goat's milk cheese, their goat's uh, soap here. And we do some honey production ourselves, and then we've also partnered with another guy that has 100 hives. We sell his honey here. We do maple syrup. We've got some sorghum syrup. And this is all local Wabash County or Kosciuszko County products. And that's, that's the cool thing. We've kind of aggregated because of our success of our farm store, they actually gave an impetus to a lot of other smaller farms. They're like, hey, if we don't want to retail or we have extra, we can go down there to the River Ridge and sell it at their store. Um, another local farm, they're a CSA farm, actually, and they got into doing, um, oh, I see they have like red fife wheat flour. We do some rye flour from them. We do artisanal rolled oats, and we also do um, blue cornmeal from them. And all these are products. These farms actually sought me out. I didn't actually go and ask any of them to do this. They all came and said, hey, can you sell this for us? And we just, every, you know, every year, every, every couple months, we'll add them the product as, as, as it comes to us. We've got some sunflower oil. We've got a guy that roasts coffee beans locally. His wife does soy wax candles. We sell that. We've got some Amish to do jams and jellies and pickles for us. Another family does granola. Um, and then, so that, that's just the retail products as far as the food products. And then we got into, because... We grow organically as much as possible. We say we're all natural. We don't, we're not certified organic. And people would start coming, look, where do you get your compost? Where do you get your fertilizer? Where do you get your amendments? And, uh, you know, it's, it's horribly expensive to ship it in, you know, if they paid uh, postage or freight. And so I said, well, actually, it's a better deal for me, for my supplier. If I buy the, buy the pallet full, I get a better price. And so we actually, um, in the springtime especially, we sell organic um, soil amendments um, yeah, by the pallet full, it seems like, here to, to just local home gardeners that want to do it organically. And then along with that, we set, we have a high million organic seed seed racks. So anyway, we kind of have our fingers in a lot of different things. Um, but we're the aggregator, like I said, for some of the other products. And we're just selling um, other products for them. But we do 99% of the vegetables we, we sell here are, do come from us. And we do supplement from the Amish up north of us. They, we get our winter squash. Um, we just don't have room for the vine crops. We buy several bins of winter squash from them. And, and we let our customers know this. We did not grow the winter squash. This came from, it's, it's a local farm, but we didn't grow it ourselves. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's been pretty awesome. It's been a, a, a wild ride in the last 10 years, I'll tell you. <laughs> and we love it. That's a pretty neat setup to end up having, uh, especially in your location. And, and that's the neat thing, too, is where our customers tell us all the time. They're like, the more stuff you get, we become a one-stop shop. We've got meat. We've got cheese. We've got flour. We've got produce. And there's a lot of ladies say, I hardly ever go to the grocery store. I mean, just, you know, to get some of the other staples, salt, um, sugar, some of that other stuff, they maybe go. But there's a lot of ladies say, we hardly ever go. Or, you know, it's funny, they'll come out and they'll confess, yeah, sorry, I wasn't here last week. It was really busy. And I went to Kroger's instead. And I'm like, hey, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't, there's not, I don't have enough product for the entire county to come. But it is, it's pretty cool to listen to the, the customers. You know, we went into business, and if I can say it selfishly, we wanted, we were f- focused on ourselves. We wanted it to, do something to provide for ourselves, our family, um, give my children, you know, something to do um, for work-wise. And uh, so I, I, we were basically self-focused. And my customers, and it's just awesome. I mean, every day we get positively reaffirmed. They're like, oh, we don't know what we used to do before you were here. And don't ever go out of business. And, and we had an accident. We had a car accident uh, several years ago. And we had an outpouring 
thousands of dollars came in from customers that just, just gave money because they're like, huh, yeah, your van's, you know, completely trashed, which we did have insurance, but um, just, it was just really cool. That whole community that begins to build um, around the fact that we have a store that provides a service and customers love it. And yeah, it's just, yeah, we reciprocate the blessing back and forth. And yeah, it's awesome. We love what we do. Now from your farm store, are your customers able to actually see the production areas on the farm? Absolutely. The first garden literally almost abuts right up to, um, and it's like, there's a four third gravel pathway and the first um, garden starts. And, uh, then yeah, the three of the tunnels are, are very visible. They're right out there. I mean, they're 200 feet from the road or less. And I invite people. I mean, a lot of people think that it's all off limits. I invite people. My customers come. I'm like, by all means. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to walk out there anywhere you want to. And we have ladies now that, that know, and it's kind of neat too. We're getting to the point now where, um, family like so the people my customers that are routine here and they've been here they'll have families from out of state come and they're like man you this there's a farm you've got to go see and they'll, they'll bring people out and uh, so yeah customers and, and even that's the cool thing about having a, is, I mean, our stuff is fresh i mean because we have so many customers coming and we're on a um, i mean if we if we need more lettuce next week then we go out and cut it for the next morning so it's only a day or two old when it leaves but beyond that if we're out of romaine lettuce or something in the store and ladies can actually go out and pick their romaine. We don't, we try to limit that in the early days. We thought that was really cool ourselves. Yeah. Hey, come out and pick out your own romaine. We're busy enough now. We try to keep everything stocked and we've been at it 10 years now. We, for the most part, know about what we can sell. Um, and that's the neat thing too. I mean, we know how many bed feet of eggplant we can sell. We know how many bed feet of romaine. I mean, we've got our, our production dialed in fairly, fairly close to what we need um, outside of things we just can't produce enough of. Um, but yeah, ladies can actually come out there and, and pick their romaine if they want it. Sometimes they're like, well, I really don't need a full bunch of dill. Can I get a half bunch? And we're, we're pretty compact as far as our, I mean, we're no more than a few hundred feet at any given point. I mean, like I said, we're a three and a half acre farm, total acreage, and uh, we're only farming on an acre and a half of that. And the store is right here. It's very compact. So yeah, customers can, can they can walk in the greenhouse and see what we're doing. I actually encourage them uh, to go out and yeah, go out and see what we're doing. <laughs> That's why you say when they ask if we're organic, I say, well, we don't use synthetic pesticides. We don't use chemicals of any sort. We use all natural amendments and, and all that. We're not certified. I always say we're customer certified. They're able to go out and see everything we do. I have nothing to hide. I say, yeah, walk through my buildings and they can, they come out and then, and that's the neat thing too. We have, like I said earlier, we have the 10 children and they've watched Carson, our oldest was seven when we started 17 today. And it's like, they've watched our kids literally grow from knee high up and the little ones come in and, and they're taking care of the store now. And a lot of times I don't even see customers. I'll, I'll yeah, I'll be like, oh, I've seen, uh, you know, Julie or whoever for, couple of weeks is she still coming and they're like oh yeah she's been here every, every week and this is because the kids interact with them and and uh, so yeah everything is accessible here on the farm and do you feel like your four season presence is an important part of making that farm store work definitely i don't i mean if we would not have by we would definitely not have the the um, sales that we do i mean we sell in vegetables alone i don't we look at the meat and everything else we sell is just kind of as uh, filler um, we sell in excess of $100,000 a year in, in produce. We're usually between 100 and 120,000 in sales, and um, every year just off. Well, that would be farm store here, restaurants, and also the farmers market. Um, but if it wasn't a year round, obviously you're going to dr- drop a lot of people off. Um, that being said, we have noticed because we're four season, because we have so much product here, um, we have what we call our core customers. The, these are people that come. I, I can count on them. I know them by name. I can count on being here um, every week. If they go on vacation, they'll let me know, hey, Nate, uh, we're going to be gone for two weeks to Europe or we're going to be going to Florida for a month just because we have that much um, connection to them and we are their food source. And I don't know, I didn't have a number for how many. There's, there's a good bulk of people this time of the year. Then we have our others that are still in that core group that come every couple of weeks, maybe once a month and pick up stuff. And then we have what I call my summer crowd and they're the ones that are from um, Memorial Day to Labor Day for the most part. And it's funny, even after 10 years, how many people are like, Hey, we just found out you're open year round. I'm like, yeah, we are. We're a four season farm, but you know, there's there's a certain constituency that's more of our rural ag community people. They're the ones they want the tomatoes, they want the cucumbers, they want the bell peppers, your warm season traditional crops. Um, and with our our four season presence too, because of our season extension, we have tomatoes by late April first of May. We're picking tomatoes, and we'll carry them clear into November. And same with bell peppers and cucumbers, all those things we have early. So as people have found out about that, that definitely draws in by being able to extend the season early and then also late. But as far as, as um, being year round, if we didn't have the vegetable production, we wouldn't be selling the meats. We wouldn't be selling so many of the other things that we sell um, here in the store as well. So definitely 
being a year round and definitely a four season um, by by all by all means makes a huge difference for us. And it gives us cash flow. I've got two employees. I didn't mention that earlier. We do have two employees um, that have been here. I think mean, both ladies have been here. They're single ladies. Um, been here probably. I think one's been here four or five years. Another is five or six. Um, and they have been a huge asset as well. So on the whole, keeping people um, being a year round farm that also gives my um, two employees. Uh, work even through the winter time, which obviously it's slower this time of the year. There's not as much to do um, in the dead of winter. I mean, your December, January, there's not as much as we get into February and March and, and on out that we really ramp things up. Uh, but yeah, just having having greenhouses in four seasons keeps my employees busy as well. I'm a little bit surprised that you're having this kind of sales success, you know, these kinds of numbers based around a town of just over 6,000 people. I mean, liberal arts college or no, that's just not right. a lot of people to be as engaged as your community is in coming and buying your organic vegetables and you know basically this this whole uh, this whole array of hippie food. Right, and we don't you know we do not charge. I I say I usually for the most part charge supermarket prices. I mean, in the early years we really I mean we vacillated back and forth on what to charge, and and we have definitely bumped our prices up. One thing I do do is in the we now the last couple of years we start charging a winter premium price so like our, our baby salad mix and our spinach um, in the summer times is four dollars a half pound bag in the winter time we bump that up uh, 50 cents we bump all our even our our herbs our bunching herbs everything we bump up 50 cents a bag um, and our because we're limited on production um and in the early years we didn't have i mean we, we run out of product the last couple of years we got it dialed in enough that we're, we're usually able to with succession plantings we're usually uh, don't run out um, and, uh, so we don't, we don't charge. I mean, I look at what my, that other, that other local organic farm that um, goes to Fort Wayne to the farmer's market, which is a minute, Fort Wayne's a huge city and he gets the big city organic prices. And I'm like, <laughs> I would love to get three bucks a bunch for carrots. I get $1.75, um, versus him. And so we're not actually charging outlandish prices. We're, we're supermarket comparable prices. So that touch more, especially on our bag greens because they are so fresh. They last for, you know, two weeks in the refrigerator and customers just go crazy over, um, and I, I, I would say that too, and that has been a part, a, a part too, because so many people are used to getting um, commercial scale um, shipped in produce to the grocery stores. They open the bag up over and over, and you know, you get it. Well, number one, yeah, I opened it up, there was bad leaves in it, or I mean, we had it, and three or four days later, it was all rotten. And we actually had the college, the university there has actually called us a time or two and said, hey, we just got a shipment in from Piazza, which is a, a, a big supplier of, of um, wholesale food. And they're like, the, the whole case of lettuce is bad. Can we come out and buy some, some lettuce, the supplement lettuce till we get fresh? And uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is the quality of it is, is we work on mineral balancing, making sure the soil is, is as fertile as possible. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that it's, it's a fresh picked, fresh washed, fresh packed product. So when it leaves, it's only hours old or only a day or two old. So it's a fresh product. And so that is driven even for some of our lower income people that come. They're like, they might only buy one bag of lettuce a week. But they're like, yeah, your stuff, I can eat on it for two or three weeks and it's still good. And so that is driven too, as is the awareness of what actual good, fresh, healthy produce is and how long it lasts. Um, that has been a drive for it too. And um, probably amongst other things as well. And what are you doing to get that shelf life? That was actually something that when I was looking at the, the limited amount of information that's available online about River Ridge Farm, there were several mm -hmm. comments about the shelf life that you're getting. and Right. And I know that shelf life isn't just a function of I picked it yesterday. There's got to be something more that you're right. doing to make that work. Yeah, well, we are, I, I am, and like I said earlier, I was a lazy kid in school. I was not stupid. I, I yeah, probably could have graduated in the top 10 of my class, but um, I did not focus in on, on, on uh, chemistry. I didn't look at soils. I mean, that stuff was, I mean, that would have been boring to me. Today, I, abs I mean, I'm an absolute soil nerd. I absolutely love soil fertility. And uh, we have read, you know, all of Albrecht's books. Um, we've got Neil Kinsey's books. Um, you know, the guy up there in Wisconsin, um, Otter has Otter Creek Farm. Um, <laughs> can't get his name now. Um, uh, uh, Gary Zimmer. Yeah, Gary Zimmer. We got his books and 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 others. And so we actually have, have really focused on um, soil fertility, getting um, our, our soil as mineral balanced as possible. We used to send off. I mean, we we have our, our soil tested every fall. And a &L Labs in Fort Wayne reads it for us. And then we used to send our, our analysis off that we, Morgan Compost in Michigan done it a couple times. We had another guy consultant in Michigan do it a few times. 
And then I'm like, well, this is crazy. I'm paying guys to do this. And I'm, I'm beginning to understand how all these different uh, nutrients work together and how to balance them. And, and we got on to, um, it was called Acres um, Publication Sells, a book or a booklet called um, The Ideal Soul Handbook. And I got that. And he really walked through a lot of those uh, mineral balancing principles. And we have started using that here and balancing our soils out and they're not perfect, but they're, they're really getting close. And so I, you know, our calcium saturation or our potassium saturation, everything is, is really, really close to being what I would call and what a lot of researchers show as, as ideal. And obviously the more dissolved solids you have in that plant, the better flavor it's going to be and the longer lasting it's going to be. And I, I, I really attribute it to that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll back up and say this, when we started, before we had that, everything ideal, I had bought an injector a, a, so we could do it right through our drip line. We started using Neptune's Harvest Fish Fertilizer. And one thing I had been discouraged is, is, is in summertime, my tomatoes, by, by July, my tomatoes in the tunnels were really, really getting small. And part of that was I didn't understand how to irrigate. I was, not, I was letting them go too dry before I'd irrigate the end. But we started irrigating with, with Neptune's Harvest Fish, injecting it into the, into the lines. And we all of a sudden were like, man, I think our tomatoes, actually are tasting better than they've ever tasted before. And we started having ladies who were like, and on top of that, the, the fruit size stayed, I mean, just huge all through clear into, into August and, and September. And uh, I didn't tell any of my customers what I was doing. And one lady said one day, she's like, what are you doing different? Are you, are you planting different kinds of tomatoes? And I said, well, no. And I thought I knew where she was going with it. And she said, well, boys, by this time of the year, your tomatoes used to be small. And she said, the flavor this year is like, way better than normal. I said, no, it's big beef. I've always grown big beef as my red slicer. And I said, and I told her what I was doing was injecting with the, the fish fertilizer into the soil. And she said, well, whatever you're doing, keep it up because it tastes great. And we have noticed, I mean, once we started them um, really dialing in on, on um, supplementing with, with fish, which I really don't even supplement with fish very much anymore. We do on occasion um, just to plus up things. But really the focus on getting soils minerally balanced and we do a lot of composting. We actually put a, uh, invest in a compost pad, like a, like a 60 by 60 pad with uh, concrete bunkers, bought a skid loader. We actually produce, I mean, we produce a ton of waste as far as vegetable waste here. And uh, we have a local rabbitry that supplies us with manure and bedding. A local guy here just across the, the street from us actually has a hobby farm for his grandkids. He brings all his manure over. We compost all those things and we, we try to add as much compost back to the soil as possible. Not near as much as, as Elliot Coleman or Ben Hartman or some of those guys do be my goal. But I really, going back to your original question, I really feel like it's the mineral balancing and really focusing on soil fertility that makes a huge difference in, in the longevity of the product. I was expecting your answer to be something that you were doing in terms of post-harvest handling. Do you guys have refrigeration and, and is we do. getting field heat out of your product an important part of what you're doing? Right. We would have two walk-in coolers. Um, we built the first ones like a nine, 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 nine feet by nine feet by nine feet tall. And I thought, I mean, that's, that's plenty of space in about, uh, see, that would have been 2013. I, we were, I mean, we maxed that thing out. We have, yeah. So anyway, I, I we uh, actually bought another uh, commercial state up, you know, we put in the back end of our, our, so we have our retail stores up front and then on the back side of the uh, pool barn. And we have our other walk-in cooler there, plus a couple other fridges. And then the retail portion, we would have a, a, a triple door glass fronted uh, retail case as well. But everything, so we, we would focus, like when we're out there harvesting, we would focus, so if we're doing radishes, uh, we tell the ladies, you know, my employees, okay, we need, you know, 30 bunches of radishes or 50 bunches, or it depends on, on what we're, we're going after. And then, then when they bring them up, we've got, we hose them off immediately, and then we've got people up there ready to start bunching them, putting bands on them. And the produce really does not, and once it's out of the ground, it's not out for I mean, less than an hour, and it's um, back in refrigeration. And we put them in, in bags and crates and then we have, we stack up in the coolers and, you know, age, age orders for us. So we know when farmer's market comes, these need to go out first and sell these. And um, so, yeah, everything is, I mean, because we are an acre to acre and a half farm um, and we do have adequate cooling space. I mean, it does. Things come out of the ground rapidly as washed and is back in, in refrigeration very, very rapidly as well. Looking at your farm and your farm layout, you mentioned that your pretty close to Ben Hartman and somewhat are farming in his shadow. Have you adapted some of his lean techniques and his thinking about how to lay out a farm and, and how to organize things there? Yeah, we do. If I was, I, I a lot of people that uh, we get asked that all the time say, do you know Ben Hartman? Yeah, I sure do. We're good friends, but um, we have, if I was to redo it, like he, he just, he moved from his original farm that was outside of, of, of actually Millersburg, uh, 
eight miles from the ocean. He actually just bought a new farm and is redesigning it exactly how he how he wants a lean farm to be. If I was to do it again, yes, I would re- redo some things for sure. Um, one thing that we have implemented uh, definitely is just the fact that is he goes over the whole spaghetti diagram thing. He said, look at where you're going. And it used to frustrate me. I had one bed prep rake from Johnny's, a 30-inch bed prep rake, and it was kept in the back of the shop if I put it away. And, you know, I'd be like, oh, where is it at? And so I would search and search. And finally, I'm like, you know, after talking to Ben and reading his books, I'm like, well, that's a dumb. I'm going to invest in eight rakes. So each tunnel has two rakes, one on the east end and one on the west end. So no matter what garden plot I'm in, I've got a bed prep rake within 50 to 100 feet. Um, and shovels, each greenhouse has a shovel if I need it. Um, so those things are some things we've done. We've, we've gotten rid of a lot of our, well, he talks about, you know, getting your harvest tools. Um, only the ones you need, we've, ex- we've, we've discarded quite a few of those. Um, farm layout wise, I mean, we're kind of landlocked here. I really can't des- redesign things um, per se, but it definitely just, the, I, I told people thinking of lean, um, just the fact of, of understanding, I don't want wasted motion. Um, definitely, we look at that. Okay, so what can we do? We're actually redesigning our, our wash area outside. How can we do this? How can we make this the most efficient so we're doing the least amount of traveling as, as possible? And even um, in the early days, um, Elliot Coleman would talk about like when you're har- harvesting tomatoes, don't just pick one, pick one or two or three in your hand. He would talk about when you're picking spinach, don't just pick one spinach leaf, put it in your bucket, you get a handful. And I, I, I do that with my employees or my children are harvesting. So some of those product things we're already doing to begin with, um, as far as like waste product, um, we have, because we're 10 years into it, we kind of, like I mentioned earlier, we already know about what we can sell everything. So we really don't have too much overproduction. Um, so no, I, we definitely use some of Ben's, Ben's principles and I look for in the, in the coming uh, future as we, as we plan and, and reevaluate, which we do, you know, constantly, definitely will be things that we will, will uh, implement of his, of his lean um, thought pattern there. All right. With that, we're going to take a quick break, get a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Nate Fingerly from River Ridge Farm. Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by High Mowing Organic Seeds. When your livelihood depends on the quality of your seeds, be confident in your investment. When you grow organically, you need to know that your seeds were selected to perform in organic conditions. High Mowing offers professional quality seeds grown by organic farmers for organic farmers. Visit High Mowing online to request a free copy of their 2018 seed catalog. Read about the company's mission and browse over 700 organic varieties, including tried and true market standards, all new high performance hybrids, and beloved heirlooms. Use the code F2FSEEDS when you purchase online or mention the code when you call to receive a 10% discount on purchases of $100 or more. Visit highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer or call 866-735-4454 to get started. The podcast is also supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, and even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and across the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. All right, and we're back with Nate Fingerly from River Ridge Farm in north central Indiana, over near North Manchester there, if you're looking on the map. So, Nate, I'd like to dig into what you're doing from a production standpoint. We talked a little bit before about what you're doing as far as the soil amendments and the fertilizers that you're using on the farm, but I'd like to kind of back up and just talk about your overall production system. What does it actually Mm -hmm. look like getting a field ready and getting a crop in the ground there at River Ridge farm. Right. So we, um, we, have, we use BCS equipment. We actually start out with Troy built and, uh, use that until we, we ran the thing through the ringer on an acre and a half of produce. And we ended up a couple of years ago investing in a BCS pillar with a flail mower. Cause we do a, a ton of cover cropping, whether it's buckwheat in a, an idle bed or whether it's uh, clover under seeded into one of the crops, which we do quite a bit of, of under seeding. Or obviously in the fall time, we see a lot of um, spiral rye and hairy vetch in areas that are in production. Um, 
And so we use a flail mower for that. We get beds ready. And we're always, and I, I've made out these bed charts. We would have um, what I call a west relay area is a 60 by 60 plot. Um, the rows are 60 feet long. And we have a, another plot. We have two plots that are uh, 30 feet rows. And that would be about the one is the like 30 by 90. The other is 30 by 60. We have a, a 75 by 50. We have two 80 by 80 plots, and then we have a 50 by um, 130 feet long as our outdoor production plus our, our uh, three third by 96 foot tunnels and our, um, our starter greenhouse, which is our, I think it's a 15 by 96. Um, so getting it ready, we would go, um, all, my, I, all my beds are already laid out. I have a chart for every single uh, growing zone outside even each tunnel and each, there's a line that corresponds for every bed. Our beds are a 42 inch bed top, approximately 30 inches when you go, it's 42 inches from aisleway to aisleway in the center, but gives us about a, roughly a 30 or a little over 30 inch wide bed. Um, we would, um, so I know what's gonna go into that bed when I sit down in the wintertime, every bed is scheduled. And, and that's partially how I make a acre to acre and a half of produce for the paper so we, we we do a lot of tight scheduling so um, we do seven plantings of green beans um they're a good cash crop they take a long time to pick we get a premium price for them but the other thing that's awesome is they're legumes they're fixing nitrogen all that yeah, biomass is going to go back into the soil on top of that we also know that my my early plantings uh, are going to get followed by um whether it'll probably be fall spinach it'll be fall radishes it might be uh, chinese cabbage in the fall time on the flip side, my later June and July plantings, I can get spinach and radishes in ahead of those. So all my green bean beds, every single one of those, will see at least two crops, of sometimes even three, in a season. Um, so I absolutely love green beans because of that. Um, a lot of our other beds, we, we do a lot of sequ- uh, succession plantings of things, and I know exactly, every week I know exactly where every crop's going to go. There's never a day of like, okay, where's this going to go? Where's it not going to go? And we know when I go out to plant or when I have my employees and my children go out to plant, we know exactly what bed, what plot, and when it's going to go in. Everything's on a calendar. And then most of that stuff now just, just gets flipped over from, from year to year. I used to transpose everything to the next year calendar. Now we just have one production calendar. We tweak it a little bit here and there, but like I said earlier, after 10 years, we have fairly much dialed in for the most part on most crops and what we can sell um, at max, you know, we're max production on, on most of our crops and what we can sell. Um, outside of things like lettuce mix, obviously, that we, in the wintertime especially, run out of. Um, so then we would come in. We already had our soil samples taken. We know exactly what each, because we have, what, we're an acre, to acre and a half of, of production. And we have actually have what I call three fertility zones. Even on that small amount of an area, we've actually seen a difference in soil fertility in what each zone needs. It's, it's, they're all fairly close, but enough different that we wanted to tweak it as much as possible. So we know what every bed I mean, I get it down to the, I mean, sometimes if I'm needing a micronutrient, I know it's, it needs like a tenth of an ounce per bed and we mix all that. We've custom blended some of that stuff together and we're doing less than that as we, as we get our soil balanced. We're doing, we don't do near as much. We're now we do a lot of just going out with a wheelbarrow, spreading compost, working in with a rake. Sometimes we till it in, kind of depends on what's been there. If, if it's been a lot of heavy crop residue, obviously we need to till it. Um, sometimes we just uh, rake it and then, and then go right back into it. Um, we do a lot of, um, we do very little direct seeding anymore. Um, we used to, in the old days, we used to seed uh, baby leaf lettuce, and that's a whole other, yeah, this is a sales pitch for Salanova. Salanova, when we went from direct seeding um, baby leaf lettuce to transplanting Salanova heads, I mean, it completely revolutionized our farm. Not only did we increase production by 40 to 50 percent just because of switching from direct seeded baby leaf to Salanova. Um, the disease, the disease issues went away. Our harvesting time went up by, <laughs> it used to take us sometimes we get so much disease in our baby leaf. It'd take us half an hour to 45 minutes to cut a bucket of lettuce. Now, if we cut, if it takes 15 minutes to cut a bucket of Salanova lettuce, we're like, what is going on? There's, you know, we got those aphids in it or it's too dirty or whatever. Um, so that's a, that's a plug for Salanova. It has revolutionized what we do here. Um, but beyond that, what I was saying on, on starting trays, we do a lot of, of trays in the greenhouse because we know, because of the schedule I do ahead of time, I know what's going to go in, what day I need to seed it. I know exactly how many flats I need. Um, and I know where it's going to go when, it's, when it comes to maturity in three, four, five weeks. Um, so we do a lot of even our beets, um, our scallions, um, trying to think what all, uh, almost all our crops. The only, I guess the only crops we would actually direct seed anymore would be like our, our sugar snap peas, our green beans. Um, radishes we would still uh, in our salad turnips we would direct seed um, and even even that occasionally I will spill 
especially early season, we'll start trays of, of radishes and salad turnips in the greenhouse and transplant them out just because I've got a four week old transplant. Like this time of year here in March, I've got a four week old transplant that's a live growing plant ready to go into the soil. Um, and also with that is just the whole thing on weed control is when I used to direct feed my scallions and, and everything, you, you, they would germinate at the same time the weeds did, and we had a mess. We had a chaotic mess. And so we learned very rapidly, especially from Elliot Coleman, hey, transplant the things. We, we can do our scallions in bunches. We can do everything in bunches and transplant it into, a, into clean soil. It's a four-week-old transplant when it goes in, and it is tremendously helpful with weeding. That being said, also, on, on, from a production standpoint of weeding, um, we take Elliot's uh, philosophy. If, if there's a weed, it needs to get pulled. Um, and we have seen in 10 years' time, we have seen our weed seed bank drop tremendously. I mean, we're not eating yet. We're not the Garden of Eden by any means. We still have weeds. I mean, that doesn't mean, well, doesn't mean we don't have weeds. We do have, um, but the weed bank has came down. Even our employees are like, we don't have a fraction of the weeds we had in the past. Wow. Even chickweed in the greenhouses in the wintertime, we have been really diligent. For, uh, there was years we'd have to till a whole bit of spinach or mosh under just because the, the chickweed had taken over. And uh, probably four or five years ago, I said, this is enough. And so we would go out there and rogue. I mean, I'd spend two hours out there in a, in a house cleaning every little chickweed seedling out. And we still have chickweed, um, but it almost never goes to seed on us. And we have seen our first house we put up that was in, what, 10 or 11 years ago. We, it's rare to even find a chickweed seedling in the house anymore just because of, of being very, very dogmatic on weed control. And we do some plastic mulching. We're starting in with uh, starting to use the uh, fabric like the low cover fabric or the um, ground cloth fabric with holes in it. Um, so those are things we do for weed control. We use hula hose, um, do some hand pulling. And there again, that being said too, with our, our Salanova production, by going from direct seed and redirect seed to this stuff, you had at least four weeks that it had to grow until it got to cuttable size. And oftentimes a little longer than that, the weeds was in there. We had, we had the weeds or you'd lose product. And when you cut it, the weeds were in the row. If you weeded it, you'd uproot lettuce plants. If you didn't weed it, then you had to pick all that out of your uh, handful that you cut with Salanova. But <clears throat> if there are a few weeds that come up, um, you can, you're can you cutting the head. We're, we're grabbing the, the main part of the leaf, of the, the heads of the leaf, and uh, out it comes. And, and the weeds, if there are any there, um, never really affect us. And we pile the bed down, and we have a fresh, clean bed again. So anyway, those are things we do. Um, definitely, um, weed control is huge. Um, no matter how we do, we used, we used to use some organic mulching like uh, leaves from the city. We use some straw. We do very little of that anymore simply because it's, we're doing so many succession plantings so rapidly um, that we don't really want to mess with the, uh, the mulch in the way. We would do some multi, like our, our uh, multi-season crop, our, our kale, our Swiss chard, our collard greens that we do outside. We would mulch those with straw for uh, somewhat for weed control, some moisture control as well. Um, but yeah, weed control is definitely huge on the farm. With transplants being so important for your farm, how are you doing your transplant production? Uh, we are using anything from a 24 cell tray. We do some 38, some 50s, some 72s, a lot of 128 cell tray. I mean, a lot of our product anymore. And, and, and we use those different, and even, I guess we would use some 200 cell trays as well. Most of those we're looking at there again because my beds are so scheduled out and I know how many transplants I need per bed. And um, we figure out, you know, so some of our, our crops, like our, our spinach, um, our Colorado transplants, a lot of those we can put in a 200 cell tray, even though it's a very small and limited and root base. And um, we know exactly where it's going to go. So if, if I need 400 plants, I know I need 200 cell tray, two, 200 cell trays. Um, so I use the cell, cell tray size to um, dictate for the most part, how many, well, how many, ever many transplants I need in the bed, I usually look at, um, the size of the plant I need, the age of the plant I'm gonna, I want it to go in the ground at um, to dictate what size uh, cell tray it goes into. We've looked at the paper pot transplanters. Ben Hartman thinks I'm, I'm a lunatic not using them. Um, at this point, because of our production space, we would have to completely retrofit our greenhouse to, to, to fit in those larger trays, of the, the paper pot trays. The other thing is, is, is we do, um, I don't know. I, I, for me, I don't think the paper pot would pay off for us. I, I mean, I know, like I said, Ben thinks I'm crazy. Um, for, for whatever reason, I just don't think it would for us. We did invest in, in one of Johnny's um, bed roller dibblers, and that marks out our beds. We can, we can change the spacing very fast on that, whether it's six rows of sound over or whether it's four rows of beats or whatever, and we can also do the in-row spacing that way as well. And then the other thing that that, that roller dibbler has been huge for is our onion transplants. We do probably six or 8,000 um, onion transplants. 
and into black plastic. And before we go through with a, a stand up planter and just dabble a hole all the way down to the row. And last year we put the thing with the bigger cogs on it and rolled that thing right down. And yeah, my children and the employees were like, <laughs> now we're talking. It, the hole was there. It was everything evenly spaced. And yeah, they went through. We, we planted onion beds in, in literally half the time or less um, with less people. And even in the old days, we would have an a eight foot row marker with, if it was six inch increments and some person bending over the row going down, bending, making holes, somebody come back in with a transplant, filling it. And now we have one person walks the, the dibbler down, marks the holes out, and then two of us come back in and very rapidly um, plant the beds. And we can plant the beds very, very rapidly. That system, system of a dibbler, rolling dibbler, and then two people transplant by hand and somebody coming right in behind and watering right in behind us. I mean, we get beds planted very, very rapidly um, at this point. What are you doing for irrigation? Irrigation, we do mostly, um, we use Toro Aquatrax um, with a six inch um, spacing uh, for a drip tape. We have a header line, um, an inch, one inch header line goes in every bed. We have figured out on our well pressure, we can irrigate about 2,000 line feet. And so semi zones, I can turn the, the hose on full blast and it waters all 2,000 line feet. Uh, semi larger zones are split into half. And uh, my larger zone has is, is actually got three zones. And we can run, uh, depends on what we're at, we can run two hoses at a time. We are a very sandy loam soil, which drains very rapidly, um, which is awesome this time of year when, when nobody else in clay soil, they're just sitting there putting their thumbs. We've actually got, I mean, we've got a pile of stuff in the ground already, direct seeded and also um, uh, transplanted. But on the converse side, if we get a lot of rain, um, it also drains very rapidly as well. That being said, if we have a drought or it's drier, we irrigate. I mean, we can get two inches of rain and, and three days later I'm irrigating some. And then we, we've learned over the years to, to make sure we're always keeping that, the, the soil moist. Um, but yeah, we use 99% of the time we're irrigating with um, our drip tape. We occasionally will use a overhead sprinkler irrigation system, um, but very, very seldom do we use that anymore. We use that some back in the early days, but anymore everything is almost 100% on drip tape. With the drip tape then, are you moving that drip tape around in the fields or are you just laying that out, using it for a season or using it for a crop and then tearing it out and, and taking it to the landfill? Yeah, it stays in for the entire season. Um, we lay three lines. So we have about a 30 inch wide bed. We use three lines per bed, uh, except in the tunnels, we get four or five lines in a bed, which those are a little bit wider beds in the tunnels. Uh, it stays in the entire season. Um, we have a very high iron content in our soil, so it, it does begin to, to plug emitters. Usually not the first season. Um, usually about a year and a half later when we really need the water, and then it starts to plug up. So we have, I hate it. That is the one thing I do not like about what we're doing here on the farm is the, the amount of, of drip tape we go through. We do, uh, yeah, at the end of the season, we pull the, pull the tape up and uh, replace it. There are some things we would eventually like to look into, whether it's a, um, yeah, Reverse osmosis is probably completely cost inhibitive. Prohibitive, so I probably will not do that. And um, there are some. Um, we have thought about using injecting some um, hydrogen peroxide in the lines. Um, and not sure if that's effective. Number one and number two, it's going to kill microbes in the soil. And we're trying to do everything we can to promote uh, soil life. So um, at this point, we haven't found a better way than to use it for a season and pull it out. I always think one of the interesting things about drip tape is that it is, it's designed as a disposable product. It's not designed to be right. used year after year after year. And, um, you know, so right. I, I think, you know, there's always that, ba there's that balancing act for anybody who's in organic, right. organic farming. Um, so yep. you mentioned the importance of weed control. What kind of tools mm -hmm. are you using for weed control on your one and a half acres of vegetables? So we would use, um, yeah, the, the first implement that I'll start with is our, from Johnny sells that glazer wheel hoe. And I can remember that would have been 10 years ago. We were looking at these, you know, long beds. Back, back then, my wife and I had this notion that her and I, and she, I, I mentioned, I failed to mention this in the beginning. She is a superwoman. I, yeah, I married my childhood sweetheart. She's awesome. And she, yeah, she is fully behind me. She helps out where she can here. And we were both out there weeding one day. These, you know, we're, at that point, our 130 foot plot was actually, we, we oriented the, the rows 130 feet long. Today, we flipped them because that zone is 130 feet by 50. We now have flipped it so it's 50 foot rows. But we were staring there one day. We both had hula hose in our hands. We're staring at these weed infested 130 foot, just the aisleways. We weren't even looking at the beds. I mean, the weeds were so thick in the aisleways, they were taking over. And I'm like, I mean, I literally stood out there and cried. I'm like, I, I, we can't do this. I mean, our dream is shattered. And, uh, 
I don't know if it was her or I, we remembered seeing in Johnny's catalog this Glazer Wheelhouse. So I went running in there, got it, opened up the book, their catalog, and sure enough, they had uh, eight inch um, blades and they had 12 inch blades. And uh, I immediately got on the phone and called Johnny's and I told her, you know, <laughs> I was probably still crying. I don't know. And, and she said, you know what? I'm going to send it to you. This is how awesome Johnny's is. She said, I'm going to send it to you. She said, when you get it, I'll, I'll send an invoice. And she said, just pay it when you get it. I said, if you don't like it, send it back. She said, in the years she'd worked there, she'd only had like, I think maybe one sent back. And it came and it was, it was a God, God sent answer. I mean, it was exactly what we needed. I mean, we use wheel hose, cut every aisle way down. It's actually one of the, one of the boys' chores every week is to go through and cut the aisle ways down. It just, yeah, it's a miracle too. We love it. So that would be how we would keep our aisles clean. Yeah, beyond that, we do a lot of, uh, like I mentioned, like the, the hula hose or the stirrup hose. Um, Johnny sells them. We've got some from a local hardware store, and we use quite a few of those. And I have actually um, made a wire weeder. Actually, I've made two different kinds of weeders. So one is just a basic, it's a nine gauge wire that I've bent into a handle. Um, and then it also has a, a very um, 90 degree, um, about a two inch hook on the end of it. It's, it's, it's kind of modeled after, um, well, Elliot would talk about making wire weeders, or Johnny's even sells it. Johnny's is I never liked theirs. It was too thick of a blade. Yep. And so I've taken, and they're just actually these hand ones. And, and all my employees, they love them. I mean, we have dozens of them. I mean, they're, they're cheap to make. And uh, they fit our hands. They, feed, they, they go right down the aisleways. And then on top of that, what I've also done, what I took that is I had, um, as they say, the, the, the quote goes, that the necessity is the mother of invention. And, and I would, was looking at my, my carrot rows. They're, even my, my salad mix were probably three inches apart. All your, your stirrup hose, most of them are, are wider than that. Most of them are four or six inch. And I had some shipping strap here that had some like the metal band that goes around your, all your greenhouse pipe when it comes as a kit. And I seen it laying there and it was, it was bent because when they go around the edge of the pallet, it's bent into a, like a, a 90 degree bend. Right. And I'm like, Hey, I can take that in our vice and in the shop and, and uh, I can make whatever size tool I want. So I've actually went through and we've got a couple of them and I've taken, put them on um, flat pieces of it's kind of like a, a plastic epoxy wood trim type thing. I mean, I got it from a local lumber company here. And I've cut them into six foot handles. And so then I actually will bend a two and a half foot inch one. The, the, the blade is two and a half inches wide and the other is three inches wide. And then I screw that drill holes and screw them. And I screw them onto that, that, um, the wood handle at the same angle that Elliot and all, all Elliot's tools are, whatever that degree is. There's a certain uh, ergonomic um, degree there that it's, it's perfect for, for weeding. And what, the way I've done it is, is, is the one blade off the end faces one direction, the other end faces the other. So I can actually flip it just in my hand. I can take the, 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 my tool, flip it from a two and a half down to a three. And it's always that the cutting blade is always at the right angle on the right side. Right. And so when I'm doing, um, cultivating carrots, um, we'll, we'll cultivate down that way. The other thing I, yeah, talking about carrots is we do, um, sale bedding. And then I also use a, I got a, um, Oh yes. Yeah, the five torch flame weeder from flameweeder.com out in, in West Virginia. And that has been a, a huge thing too. I mean, we, we flame, we are, we feed our carrots. Um, let them come up for, or let the weeds germinate, water them really heavy, let the weeds germinate, and uh, then flame it off about day five. And we have, the illustration of that is, and I, I, I tell the same time I do a farm tour here, um, we do, in, in, the, in the fall time, um, we would do um, 12 beds of carrots that are, um, they're usually, to put those in one of the 80 foot plots, we've got 12 80 foot long beds. There's four to six rows of carrots on a bed, depends on, on, on the carrot that I'm growing. And uh, we used to spend hours, literally, I mean, crazy amounts of time hand weeding. And I bought the flame weeder. Actually, before that, I actually just bought a, a protein tank and a, a flamethrower, like a, a handheld, just a single nozzle thing. And uh, I thought, well, I want to see if this was really working. And so I had left. We had, um, I, I flamed off 11 beds, left the 12th one, and didn't flame it. And I spent probably, I don't know if I spent an hour, maybe, two hours at most flaming those first 11 beds, we spent about six hours hand weeding that last bed. And that, I mean, it just, and I've even done it occasionally if I'm doing a farm tour for tools, uh, we've done a few of those, I'll actually leave a, a, a section of the bed unflamed just so that people can see that the beginning farmers or, or even the experienced farmers that haven't had experience with flame weeding can actually see what it does. It is, yeah, all those things um, revolutionize. Um, and I always say this too, when I'm talking on tools, um, especially when I do a small farm uh, tool presentation, the fact that the neighboring farmer, when he has a, a, a 40 horsepower tractor, um, I would be, I'd be a fool to use his tractor on my property, acre and a half. He would be a fool to till his thousand acres with my BCS on the same thing. 
we have as small farmers, especially today, I mean, 10 years ago, there was zero some tools. Today, in 2018, we've got piles of tools. I mean, companies that are designed to make scale appropriate tools for the farm. And so I say that the beginning farmers or anybody, for the small scale intensive vegetable operation, there are, there's a wealth of tools that are scale appropriate for us. And that's, yeah, it's been a blessing to us, really. It really is amazing what's happened with that in the last 10 years. <laughs> and in, in the story to do with that, that, I mentioned earlier that, that um, rolling dibbler we got from Johnny's. And uh, I had gotten the, very frustrated before they came out with that. I, I one day I sat down, I'm like, there's got to be a better way than planting our, our Salanova plugs by, by hand, bent over the row with this, this row marker. And so I sat down and I figured out and how to cut a, a, a disc out of, of plywood. I cut two of those out. And I connected them by, I think, an inch and a half by inch and a half. It was a 30 inch wide. Then I took um, PVC and cut them, at, I think it was an inch and a half PVC pipe that I cut an inch and a half long, ran a bolt and a washer through it. And I made this rolling dibbler that was just, it was six rows on a bed at six inches for our Salanova. And uh, I've done a small farm. Um, farm tool um, presentation or two here at the farm and people are like, Oh, you get to patent that thing. And I actually, I didn't have enough time to do that. I actually, I'm like, Hey, this, you know, this is something. And guess what? The next year Johnny's catalog comes out and somebody else is already thinking it. So and that's happened more than once on tools all designed here on the farm. And then the next year uh, there's already somebody else is thinking about it. So it's kind of neat how our minds work together as you're looking at a problem and you think, how can we fix this? And, and that's the neat thing about the small farm world today. There's so many minds many bright minds that are thinking about these things, that there's just a wealth of information, a wealth of tools out there that's available. I agree. Absolutely. I'd like to talk about your winter production and what, well, mm -hmm. winter production and season extension more broadly and about right. how are you managing your high tunnels? Yeah. So we have, um, we finally have three 30 by 96 foot tunnels. And I've told people that, um, frankly, I probably will never get to this because I hate managing plastic. But I, I wouldn't hesitate to have my whole acre to acre and a half covered at some point. I probably never will um, just because of, of finances. And, and I like, yeah, there's just certain advantages to outdoor production. Um, that being said, I always tell farmers, whenever I do a beginning farmer tour here, which we do a pile of tours here, I always say, if you're getting into farming, do not start with open soil. Put up a high tunnel and then grow outside if you have to because the, 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 the control is so much better. The quality is so much better and your season is yeah almost unlimited. Um, so what we do with, with three tunnels now, we're able to, three of the larger tunnels, we're able to do a lot of the, um, the succession plantings and also sequencing. So two of those houses are unheated houses. They're just what I call passive solar. We have to roll the sides up to ventilate. Um, and then we use a lot of row cover uh, to cover over in the beds. Then our other big 30 by 96 foot tunnel is a heated house. So we heat to 32 in the winter. And then my nursery house, which is the 15 by 96, it's heated also. We start our trades in that year round. And then also do some uh, hail and herb production in there in the wintertime. So what we're able to do is we would, we would take our two unheated tunnels. And, and starting back in September, we would start seeding spinach in there. We'd start doing um, some se um, sequence plantings of Salanova. We'd also have some mezcal and salad blend that we would direct seed in there. And we do um, multiple plantings in those houses. And once the, the, those houses fill up, usually by latter October, we're, we're done planting in there. Or yeah, usually by mid-October, we would be done in the unheated houses. By um, latter October through uh, most of the month of November, we plant into the, the minimal heated houses and get those filled up. And so it basically it keeps us in the wintertime with a continuous flow of our, of our salad mix because until it's too cold in the unheated houses, which usually is right around Christmas time, it's about too cold for lettuce production in the unheated houses. However, we would have spinach and mosh would both grow very, very well in our uh, unheated houses. And we have a fair amount of that in there. Um, and then we, because we have the three houses, so like this time of year, our two heated houses are fully planted now to tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and eggplant and basil, all those warm season crops. So we're getting a far jump on those crops. And we always tell our customers, if you're a gardener, we'll be uh, producing the right crops. We'll be picking right tomatoes in May when here in Indiana, you're just now normally planting your tomatoes outside. And that's kind of a gauge for them um, to know what we should have coming up. Um, and then we would also, so then we would do a, a, a February or, or March planting in the heated houses. And then in our one end heated house, we would do another planting of tomatoes and peppers, the whole nine yards of the season, warm season stuff we would do inside in mid April. And then obviously outside in mid May. And then the other house, um, our, we had a um, couple of years ago, we put up a, our third big tunnel and we're actually going to start using um, 
shade cloth on that in the summertime for, for to extend our salanova production. We, we're to the point now where summer salad mix, nobody produces it here, and uh, we can sell hundreds of pounds of the stuff a week if we have it. So we're going to do our continue to do our outdoor production. We're also going to do um, a, a 96 foot bed each week inside the, uh, the uh, greenhouse with um, shade cloth on it. We'll use 50% shade cloth on top of that. Um, so that we, for the most part, I think, cover. And, and even this time of year, I, I should mention, as we have beds finish up, so as we have um, like lettuce mix, the sound of it would, would finish up in my unheated houses. We actually have trays in the greenhouse waiting to go back in. So we don't hesitate. If here in Indiana, we get, we've had some nasty cold. But even in December and January, we'll go ahead and replant those beds if we get a, if we get a couple of day window that it's, it's going to be really sunny and maybe not quite as cold at night. We'll go ahead and plant, water it in, and then we'll lay row cover over top of it. And that's something that we came out with with Brady's and Grant that uh, Ben Hartman and Dave Rob and I worked on was looking at, um, you know, Elliot would always say, use your, your nine gauge wire wicket, hold your row cover up over top of your beds. And Ben and some other farms, um, uh, through that uh, frozen ground cover to begin looking at the impact of laying your row cover right on top of the beds. And uh, so one of the things we know with this Purdue grant was to look at um, what is the production difference. And we actually had monitors. They, they stuck soil temperature gauges. We put air temperature gauges, um, you know, the PAR uh, light meters. We had the whole nine yards of moisture meters. And so what we done on those beds, we would take as well as mix and also the spinach and we would do an uncovered bed section. We would do a, a section covered with what we call the blanketing where it lays right on top of the crop. And then we'd also do um, sections where it was held up on top of the crop with our, our wickets. And we'd done multiple um, repeated uh, tests inside the greenhouses that way. And we found out that the laying and blanketing it right on top definitely keeps the crop warmer and higher production. So where I'm driving to with that is, even in the dead of winter here in cold Indiana, we, we do not hesitate to seed or even put transplants in. And this winter here in Indiana, we had, we had two weeks solid that the temperature um, would get down. It was negative every night, and we would not even get out of, out of 20 degrees as they're high. And every single morning, I would go down there and peek underneath that double row cover, double it's a bed that's blanketed right on top of a baby transplant, hadn't even been in a week, and would look underneath there, and the, the plants were never froze, and the soil never froze. And we had some really, really cold temperatures. This winter really tested that theory. And we have never had a better winter yet of lettuce production just by using that row cover, a double air row cover blanketed right over top of the bed. And we had just really increased production that way. Um, and then we also, like as, as mosh finishes up, as some of the beds finish up, we'll go back in and direct seed or even transplant um, radishes or salad turnips or very quick turning crops that we preceding my tomatoes and peppers that come up, like my April planted house. We are beginning in the unheated house now behind the mosh. We're beginning to pull radishes. We've got salad turnips. We've got scallions coming out. Um, that in years past, I just kind of let set when the, when the bed was done, it was just done until my warm season crops. And now we have to look at that. Hey, how can we pack another crop in? So like my, my beds of peppers and tomatoes and eggplant, all those things, um, we would run, I don't have, yeah, if you, you'd have to see a picture to understand it, but you, I'll, I'll explain it. So like on my tomatoes, I'm like, we'll plant rows of cherry tomatoes and, and big beef um, slicing tomatoes right down the center of the row of, of, the, of the bed in the greenhouse or the tunnel. And then we'll come in and I have beet, um, plugs of beets that we plant, transplant on the south side. And then we have head lettuces like our romaines and our mirror lettuce, magenta lettuces that we'll transplant on the north side, on the shady side. And we'll actually, and we'll get 250 to 350 ahead. And so you set 96 of those in a bed, or well, 90 actually, you get off some of your, your walkways at the end. A 90, ro 90 foot row of, of lettuce times average of $3, you're looking at multiple hundreds of dollars per bed. And we'll have, you know, six rows of that in a tunnel. And then you have your beets on the south side at $1.75 a bunch for four or five beets. And there is another several hundred dollars in a bed. So what we're looking at is we are cash crops of tomato that will produce, you know, thousands of pounds out of the house at a, at a high crop, at a high price. But we've also got romaine lettuce and we've got um, our beets. And also we're starting to do some arugula. We can transplant the arugula right down the, the pepper rows, right down the center. And so before those plants, before the tomatoes and peppers need the space, we've got extra crops coming out at, close to thousand dollars per house just in, in our, our actually it's multiple thousand dollars just in arugula romaine lettuce and beets which is just fantastic um and we would do that on in both our our um, march planted house and our april planted house as well 
we have not yet done it outside. Now, that's what I keep saying. I'm an acre and a half. I love it because I am not, we haven't dialed our fertility in and we have not dialed in our, our multiple plantings. I could even do that on my tomatoes and peppers outside. I could easily have arugula in my outdoor peppers before they produce and, and we, we start planting those in May. So I, I always love it as a farm. We haven't even tipped the ice. We're just at the tip of the iceberg of production even. Even though we do so much succession planting, we do so much planting. Um, before the season even starts, there's so much more we can yet even do, yeah, which is just exciting to me. Um, and then outside on season extension, we would do, we use a lot of um, Johnny, we've got Johnny's um, quick hoop spinners, and we have bet, um, we have several hundred of the um, double row covers and also the single row covers, and we would do, like this time of the year, we've got um, so yeah, here in Indiana in, in March, early March, we're still pretty cold, and we've got tall rabbi, we've got beets, we've got scallions, we've got cabbage, we've got peas, Carrots, radishes, you name it. We got all those cold season crops either in the ground seeded to coming up or we also have them transplanted. And then we use the the, the hoops and row covers and sandbags. Um, we sandbag the snot out of them things to keep them um, held down. And uh, we extend our season by tremendous um, amounts. That way to the point that actually we sell some of those systems to some of our, our home garden customers that come here. They'll see these little white tents everywhere. Like, what are those things? And they'll also, well, it's just, you know, it's just a 10 foot piece of condo that we've bent. And so they're like, where can we get them? And I'm, so we've ended up selling, you know, systems of I'll sell next amount of the, of the hoops and I'll cut off a row cover for them. And we'll sell them the sandbags and, and uh, customers here, just our home garden customers are amazed at what one piece of Agrabon 30 and some sandbags and row cover will do. I mean, it's just incredible. And um, the season decision, even my home gardeners can recognize from it, let alone a, a commercial farm like uh, what we're doing. I have the one other the one other secret that I'll share that we do on season extension is, and this is an Elliot Coleman um, spinoff, is in late November, first of December, right before ground freezes up, we'll seed a um, a whole uh, row of peas, and we'll seed uh, two beds of carrots and a bed of spinach and cilantro, and then cover those with hoops and the row cover, and sometimes we'll even use plastic. And this time of year, we're almost ready outside in Indiana to start harvesting um, spinach and cilantro. And within within the month of April, we'll start pulling carrots and peas, um, just because we seeded them and they clear back in in right before winter hit. They sit there as a a, a dormant plant, and usually in in um, definitely by February, they have germinated and are actively growing. And those are crops that we they're just kind of out there doing their thing. And and when April comes, we'll uncover the beds and we got a, a fresh product ready to go. So we use a multifaceted approach to, to season extension here. I love that. I mean, I I, I always think those those tricks of, you know, doing things like seeding the peas in the fall and, and getting an extra early crop out of that. I think it's just such an elegant use of the biology that goes into our vegetable plants because so much of that, so many of our vegetable crops were actually bred or evolved in kind of this Mediterranean climate, which is, you know, the same latitudes that we're at here, but with really different temperatures. But a lot of times they were really designed to, to go through the, I mean, designed with finger quotes to go through the winter and, and to, and to come up in the spring. And I really love that idea of taking advantage of that. Yeah. Yep. All right. With that, we're going to turn here to our lightning round, but first we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor. Hey, Nate, you're using Vermont compost potting soils on your farm. I wonder if you've got a couple words for us about what you like about it and why it's worth getting that shipped to Indiana. Yeah, we, for years, we used just uh, your standard ProMix, and we always told people we raised good plants. I used some fish fertilizer as a supplement. We had good plants. The transplants looked nice, um, but they just weren't what I thought they could be, and we were, um, I had a grant project with uh, Purdue University, and so Ben Hartman was one of their farms in that grant project, and so we was at his farm for a, a uh, farm meeting, and I went in his greenhouse, and I saw his tomatoes, and they were the m- nicest, most gorgeous tomatoes, the same age as mine. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing, Ben? He says, well, have you ever heard of Vermont compost? And I had, but it was, in my mind, it was too expensive. And uh, he says, Nate, it's, you'll never regret it. So we called and got a pallet of, I think two pallets, actually, the four of each shipped in. And it completely revolutionized. I mean, we went from <laughs> okay transplants that were, they were okay, but they weren't as healthy here as they could be to being these vibrant, lush plants. Um, I, yeah, hands down, it is by far worth the money. And it's actually when you start looking at trying to add, because I, I used to actually do some soil blends in my own buying pro mix and buying compost and adding stuff in. And we got some stuff that was really close to the Vermont compost quality. But I even showed when uh, Jennifer was here a year ago, I showed her uh, 
my my custom soil blend versus Ver, for, Vermont compost 4V, and the 4V was still beating even the best stuff I could produce. Um, it's by hands down, it's, it's it's worth it. It's a consistent product, and it grows awesome plants. All right there, you have it, VermontCompost.com. Nate, we talked a lot about tools, but what's your favorite tool on the farm? All right, Chris. Well, I'm going to tell you that that's, that's completely, number one, it's unfair. And that's also a million dollar question because there is no way I can limit myself to one tool. Um, but I can go through a very lightning quick um, rundown of some of my tools that I do use very rapidly. Um, if I, well, yeah, I really can't say there's one tool that I use. ECS, definitely. Uh, the walking tractor with the, the tiller and the flail mower is huge. Um, the Johnny's, I mentioned earlier, the Johnny's bed prep rake is revolutionary for us. Um, we use the earthway cedar, just the old lowly humble earthway cedar and the Johnny six row cedar work excellent on our farm. We got the five row um, or the five porch flame weeder that we use. And then we actually buy a, a skid loader a couple of years ago to turn our compost and unload our semi. And when they come with the supplies, those are probably the things I would use, but I cannot limit it to just one there. Yeah. I use so many different things here on the farm and, and love every one of them. And I'll bet you're going to say the same thing about your favorite crop to grow. <laughs> Yeah, to me, if I was picking one to eat, it would be tomato. If it was one to sell, it'd be lettuce. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, why is lettuce your favorite one to sell? Just because it is, it's we, that is the crop that I, I tout as being our fifty-two week of the year crop. We have there is never a week that we do not have fresh lettuce available, whether it's a head or or mostly our bag salad mix. Um, and it's it's beautiful. It's you look at our rows actually on the uh, the one Facebook group we're on the. Uh, the uh, lettuce production in challenging climates, they actually, um, Michael Kilpatrick actually used a, a, an aerial shot of our farm because of our lettuce production because we're transplanting the Salanova in, in, um, by hand. We're not using the paper pot transplanter. We have, and my, my, my employees actually do this because number one, it's pretty, and number two, it's how we harvest down the row. When we're harvesting the Salanova, we'll go through with our five gallon buckets and we'll cut a redhead, a greenhead, a redhead, a greenhead, all the way down the row. So we're getting a mix of the different kinds. And it actually, it's aesthetically pleasing. We actually have airplane pilots like the guys that are flying the Cessnas will say, we love flying over your farm. We will actually show people from the air your farm because it looks like a, a patchwork quilt down there with all these different lettuce pillars in, the, in these, you know, sometimes our whole beds will be, you know, a whole 80 by 80 bed will be nothing but, but lettuce and red and green tapestry. And it's absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah, man, it's a hot selling product. So anyway, we love lettuce. Love and it. then kind of our calling card, we, we've said lettuce has been our, it is what we're known for. We started out day one with lettuce production and we are known um, as a, a lettuce farm. And that all being said too, when I was planting the, 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 the farm out in the beginning, uh, 11 years ago, we went for broke. We quit the factory cold turkey. And I said, we're going to make this thing work. And so we spent a lot of time. Um, we get a lot of um, growing for markets books, uh, Lynn Bozinski's book. She had uh, the Hoop House handbooks and some of those. And we looked at, okay, so what are the high value crops? Lettuce mix, spinach, mezcon. Those are really high dollar crops. What are some other product? What are what else goes with that? Well, you've got your radishes, you've got your scallions, you've got your carrots, cucumbers, bell peppers. Those are all things that people eat on our salads. They're high value crops for us, and so those are things we looked at. I would say, from a production financial standpoint, um, I, I, there's hardly a better crop in my mind than peppers and cucumbers, simply because we still command a dollar each, whether it's a green pepper or it's a cucumber, all season long. Even when other guys are at fifty cents a piece, we'll sell hundreds, literally hundreds. And especially early season, when I go in there, I, I just love it. You go in there and you, you see these cucumber vines trellised up. You know, they're eight feet tall. They're, they're loaded with cucumbers. I'll go in there. It's not uncommon to pick four or 500 cucumbers twice a week. And every time I grab a hold of one of those and cut it off, it's a dollar in the bucket. It's a dollar in our container. And we, we hardly ever even dump any of those as far as compost. We sell so many of those because people are coming to the store. They're farmer's market. They're early. They're fresh. And uh, so we love cucumbers and peppers simply because that's a $1.00. Every everyone that goes in the, in the container is one dollar, and then tomatoes we get three to three fifty a pound for those most of the season. Another crop, you know, we we produce thousands of pounds, especially as we prune them, as we learn how to grow them. So those are all high value crops for us that we 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 like too. But if, if it was just one, it would definitely be Salanova lettuce or the multi cut lettuce. We use some of Osborne's and High Millions uh, multi cut lettuce as well. All right. And finally, Nate, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, yeah, I'll pass on what I w was passed on to me. So there was a, a, actually he was a pastor at the church we used to go to. He was actually, he was raised in a construction business. He didn't want to be in construction anymore. He wanted to be 
um, with his family, kind of like what our vision was. And so he said, you have to figure out, um, I'll pass on two things. So he said, you have to figure out if you want to work at home or if you want to um, work for yourself. And so he, he said, you know, vegetables was probably what, you, you know, vegetables or he had a couple other lists. So anyway, we went with that. And he said, now, the next thing is going to be this. Um, well, no, I guess that, that was what he passed on to me. He passed on these two thoughts. The number one was, just reckon it in your mind right now. You're not going to get all your work done in the beginning. It, eventually, you'll get to the point where most of your work gets done. So just sell it in your mind that you're not going to get you all the work done. So that helped us in the early years. We realized the first couple of years, we were in over our heads. We realized it's going to get better. Because his second point was to me is, he said, it's going to give, give yourself five years. And if I was going to write a book, it would be titled The First Five Years. Because he said, and as he, as he quit the construction business and went into dairy farming, he said he fell flat on his face the first year. And he said, I had dead cows everywhere. I didn't know what I was doing. And he said, but at the end of the year, I would look back and say, hey, next year it's going to be better. And he told me, he says, so Nate, if you get to the end of the year and you have no hope for next year, you have nothing you can do to make it better. He says, get out and get out fast. But he said, if you get to the end of the season and you've got hope for next year, he says, go at it again. And we've used that. And I look at it because at year five, I arrogantly thought we had arrived. Because, I mean, so the first year we sold, you know, $30,000 of produce uh, in 2008, and every year it increased by multiple thousands of dollars. And so by year five, I'm like, hey, we've got our, our, our calendar is just our planning calendar is getting close and our production. I look back now at 10 years, I'm like, <laughs> I'm embarrassed at what I thought I knew at year five because we learned so much every year. So don't give up learning. That's another, another thing I'd pass on. Never give up learning. <laughs> Connect yourself to other farmers and learn as much as you can and go out and apply. Nate, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. And we appreciate uh, all you do, Chris, and, and look forward to listening to, to uh, more podcasts in years to come. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 169 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And I'll note that you can find the notes for the show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Fingerly. That's F-I-N-G-E-R-L-E. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Or talk to us in the show notes and tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, let them know you, how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world. And you can help. And speaking of helping by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate, I'd like to start a tractor in thanks to Matt Arthur and Patricia Noldy for their support of the show. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Keep the tractor running.